Good morning, church family. Oh, it's good to be here with you this morning. I just have to speak uh, to who I am. If you're here for the first time, I am not Pastor Andy. I am not the senior pastor. I am the minister of discipleship, and my name is Bonnie. And one thing that I do is I uh, do next steps. I see people where they are, and I try and help them get to their next step spiritually. And one way that we do that here is by through small groups and bands. And if I can just speak to that without getting emotional, if you want to know what a band looks like, it looks like that front row right there. My band is sitting there loving me and supporting me today. And that is what being in community together looks like. So thank you. Uh, so far, we have been in the book of Hebrews, and we have done chapter 1 and 2, and we have learned a few things. We've learned that God is still speaking to us today. We've seen that Jesus is greater than the angels, and we've been reminded that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human. And because of this knowledge, we now know that we should listen to his message about salvation. Now we turn the page and we enter into the third chapter of Hebrews. 19 verses that we have already heard read that we are going to dig deep into. But first, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would use me a willing vessel. Come into this space. Open our ears and open our spirits to how you want to speak to each of us, including me, in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we get started today, I'm going to tell you a fun fact about myself. If any of you ever drive by the church late at night and wonder, what in the world is Bonnie's car still doing there? As my mom likes to say, I'm someone who likes to burn the candle from both ends. Um, being in school full-time and working full-time, I often will quote-unquote clock out of work and then clock in to school. Uh, but this week on Thursday, I was here until 11 o'clock because I was just completely geeking out on preparing for this sermon. I am that kid who would read the encyclopedia or the dictionary when I was younger. My parents gave me, and I would have brought it today, but it's like 10 pounds. They gave me an encyclopedic dictionary when I was a kid, and I would spend hours just looking and learning and asking questions. And I literally, when I went and moved to college, I asked my parents, can I take that with me? Is that weird? And they're like, no. They loved me enough to just let me be me. And 18 moves later, that book still sits on my bookshelf in my room. So this week, I grabbed all the commentaries. I read all the versions of Hebrews chapter 3 in different translations, and I just soaked it all in. And then I said, yikes, that's a lot of information. How am I going to share that in 20 minutes? <laughs> so that is what we are going to attempt to do today. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them up to chapter 3. And we will dive in. Chapter 3 is broken into two main parts. The first part are verses 1 through 6, which is a period of exhortation. And the second section, verses 7 through 19, switches to a period of exposition. Exhortation is an address or communication emphatically urging someone to do something, where an exposition is a comprehensive description and explanation of an idea or theory. So basically what that means is in the chapter we see laid out that you need to know that there's something to do, and then you're going to be explained how you do that with an example. So in chapter 3, we see four simple words, and it says, holy brothers and sisters. This is important because this is the first time that the audience is actually addressed in the book of Hebrews, and it tells us who they are. It tells us that they were holy, which means that they were Christ's followers. 
and that they were addressed as brothers and sisters means that they were a part of the family of God. They were being reminded with those words that God had chose them to be their people. Then, similar to the comparison we saw earlier in the, in the book of Hebrews, where Jesus is compared to the angels, the writer of Hebrews spends time comparing Jesus to Moses. Moses is lifted up as one who was faithful in everything that he did in the house of God. The reason that this comparison is important is because between Moses and Jesus, Moses, or between Moses and Abraham, Moses is the second most important person in the Old Testament to the Jewish people. They would connect with him and know and be pointed to the law in the Old Testament. During these verses, the writer never says a single disparaging word about Moses, but explains, to Jesus, and explains and points to Jesus and his faithfulness and shows that even more so than Moses, we should be faithful to Jesus. And he uses the analogy of a house. Moses was faithful as someone who served in the house of God, where Jesus, as the Son of God, is over God's house and is therefore superior to Moses. Then, if your mind isn't hurting enough from all of this, we are reminded that God is the builder of that house and is in fact the builder of everything. And since we believe in a triune God, we know that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. So Jesus is God. So Jesus is therefore superior to Moses. This would be an encouragement to those first century believers to remain faithful to Christ, even in the midst of the tough trials that they were experiencing. Instead of going back to Moses and back to the Old Testament law, they should imitate Moses and be faithful to God. And then we arrive at verse 6. Verse 6 reads, But Christ is faithful as the Son over the house of God, and we are his house if we hold tightly to what we are certain about. We must hold tightly to the hope we boast in. Let me read that middle section again. We are his house if we hold tightly. What we find in verse 6 and later in verse 14 is a conditional statement. There are literally only seven or eight times in the entire New Testament where Scripture makes a statement about the people's relationship with God that includes a qualifier. And we find two of those in this chapter, which means we have to do something. So what does doing something look like? Well, we're going to put a pin on that question, and we're going to come back to it. For now, we are going to move into verses 7 through 19, where we come to the portion of the chapter warning us to remain faithful by pointing to the Old Testament story of the Israelites in the wilderness. The Exodus story shares of how great the nation of Israel had just seen that the plagues had happened. They'd experienced deliverance from Pharaoh through the parting of the Red Seas. God had provided them with manna, and then they complained, and then they got quail, and they got water, and they had finally been freed from hundreds of years of slavery, and they continued to complain. Their hearts were hard. They were southern, and their hearts went astray. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were so unfaithful in this moment that they literally said that they would rather go back to slavery than to deal with what they were dealing with. The writer of Hebrews points to the Exodus story and pleads with the people, don't make the same mistake that the Israelites made. If you can hear what I'm saying, then you need to listen. It's important to know that biblical writers are rarely excessive with their words or overly emotional. You have your occasional exceptions like David writing a lengthy psalm or Jeremiah expressing his emotions openly. 
But for the most part, biblical writers are succinct. So when you come to a portion of text, like what you find here in the latter portion of chapter three, we should take notice. First, we should notice that there is an inclusio. Last week, Pastor Andy explained to us what that means is that there's the same phrase at the beginning of the segment and at the end of the segment. And it's like bookends to tell you, hey, pay attention. This is what that bookend says. If you hear it, don't be stubborn. You were stubborn when you opposed me. These statements in the bulk of this portion of chapter 3 come directly from Psalm 95. In this section of Hebrews, we also find the second conditional statement in verse 14, which reads, We belong to Christ if we hold tightly to the faith we had at first, but we must hold tightly until the end. So the faith at first... We're talking about our salvation moment faith. And we are again encouraged to hold tightly to it. The chapter ends with a series of questions starting in verses 16 and we read, Who were those who heard and refused to obey? Weren't they all the people Moses led out of Egypt? Who was God angry with for 40 years? Wasn't it those who had sinned? They died in the desert. God promised that those people would never enjoy the rest he planned for them. God gave his word when he made that promise. Didn't he make that promise to those who didn't obey? So we see that they weren't able to enter. That's because they didn't believe. Verse 19 is like the mic drop at the end of the chapter. They didn't believe. In the interpreter's one volume commentary on the Bible, it expounds on this statement, and I have to read it to you. It's so good. It reads, <clears throat> The essence of sin is adultery, the refusal to worship the true God. This is also the deceitfulness of sin. As long as we avoid the more dramatic sins and crimes, we find ourselves to be sound. But the subtlety of sin is that it puts something, sometimes even something good, in the place of God. Man's original sin is to put his own preferences before the will of God. And as a result, all the structures of his life are distorted and misshapen. The congregation here addressed was most likely an orderly and respectable group unmarred by crimes and vices, but in their complacent respectability, they are in danger of losing God. What they need most of all is the recovery of a sensitivity of God's work and presence among them. So what does that look like? the recovery of his sensitivity to God's work and presence among them. First, I would point to our handy-dandy bookmark that we have. If you've lost yours or never got one, this is a bookmark that um, outlines the four core or the eight core practices. God bless, I should know that. The eight core practices. Um, and we did a sermon series last summer that shared all of those, which you can still find on the website. These point to you and speak to how we can be obedient in our life with Christ. In the text today, we read in verses 12 and 13. Brothers and sisters, make sure that none of you has a sinful heart. Do not let an unbelieving heart turn you away from the living God, but build one another up every day. Do it as long as there is still time. Then none of you will become stubborn. You won't be fooled by sin's tricks. This speaks to the importance of community. It speaks to the life of living together in bands and in small groups. It speaks to growing with each other in accountability. And if we look at the different core practices, we see 
that this is how we're obedient to God, through prayer, through scripture, through service, witnessing, stewardship, worshiping God, and setting aside a day each week of Sabbath. These eight core practices are active ways that we can be obedient in our life to Christ. But I don't know about you, but there are some times that I have to admit in my band meetings that I have missed the mark when it comes to some of these. I don't know if you recall this, but the last time that I preached was on Valentine's Day. And I shared about the importance of falling in love with the Holy Spirit. I actually preached what would typically be considered a Pentecost Sunday sermon. I didn't know at the time that I would be preaching today, which is literally Pentecost Sunday. God's kind of cool like that. (laughs) And it connects to the scripture today. So I'm going to read to you a portion of Acts 2. Starting in verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below. It continues on in verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured it out for you to see and hear. I encourage you, if you haven't spent time in Acts chapter 2, to... Dig deep into it. It's a remarkable chapter. Not only does it describe historically that first Pentecost Sunday, it also speaks to us today and what the church should look like. It's amazing how scripture can do that. It speaks to not just the past, but the present and the future. And our passage today does just that. I conveniently left out verse 7 to share with you now, and it reads, The Holy Spirit says, listen to his voice. These words of the Holy Spirit are present day speaking, not past tense. The Spirit was speaking both to the people in the book of Hebrews, and the Spirit is speaking to us today. So now we come back to that question. What does doing something look like? Well, I think it's one of those twofold answers. Yes, it looks like faithful obedience through doing core practices, but we can't do that on our own. This is us trying to do it on our own unless what we are doing is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Can you remember a time in your life when the Holy Spirit moved in your midst? You felt the Spirit like a wind on your back moving you forward. You felt it like a breath of fresh air to help you in a time of need. Can you remember when the Holy Spirit moved through you A moment where you felt prompted out of nowhere to pray for someone and you didn't even know what was happening in their life. But you later learned that that prayer sustained them in a time of need. As we reflect on those questions and the knowledge we've gained from the book of Hebrews today, I'd like to conclude our time with the same prayer that I prayed on Valentine's Day. And as I read this prayer... I ask that you would find a position of comfort where you can just lean into how God is speaking to you, whether that be at the altar, whether that be on your knees. Just spend time allowing these words to speak to your heart.
Bow with me now. Spirit, we know that we have done wrong by you. Please forgive us for grieving, resisting, and quenching you. We have resisted you through our sin, our rebellion, and through our hardness of heart. At times, we have been spiritually blind. At other times, we knew what you wanted us to do, but we chose to ignore you. Yet this is not how we want to live now. We need you to change us. Only through you can we truly worship. Spirit of the Lord, you are the one who brings us to a place where we can worship. You are the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of life. We need your wisdom and understanding as we seek to live this life. Keep us from disbelief and from fear. We need your strength to help us do what you are asking us to do and to live how you are asking us to live. Speak loudly and drown out the other voices calling us to conform to the patterns of this world. You are the spirit of self-control and love. Give us that self-control needed to deny our flesh and to follow you. Give us a love strong enough to motivate courageous action. Manifest yourself through us that we may serve and love your bride, the church, just as you do. We say, come, Holy Spirit, come. We don't know exactly what that means and looks like for each of us yet. In this particular place, you've called us to be. But nonetheless, whatever it means, we ask for your presence. And we say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. I encourage you as we move into this final song to continue to stay open to how the Holy Spirit is moving and to ask the simple question, what do I need to do, Lord, in order to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and make the choice to hold tight 